Okay. All right. Um, it's great to be here at ICDS. Um, I'm going to tell you about some experiments that we are, have been doing over the last um, year or so. Um, so it, it might be a kind of a, a sort of rough shift for some of you because we are moving from sort of uh, more theoretical talks to experiments, but eventually, uh, you know, we want some guidance to measure some interesting quantities and hopefully uh, my talk would serve as some cue towards uh, those sort of uh, ideas. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about an experiment which has a multiband system which is based in graphene uh, derivative, which is three layers of graphene. Uh, and we measure the Berry phase uh, induced quantum oscillation phase shift. Okay. Uh, I gratefully acknowledge the funding su uh, support for our work from Department of Atomic Energy uh, and Department of Science and Technology, which makes this work possible. Uh, these are uh, the papers which are related. This has the gory details uh, that I'll uh, probably uh, try to convey, but might skip some of the things. Um, so I want to acknowledge my collaborators because they really make the things happen. Uh, so my two students, Biswajit Datta, uh, who is now at UC Santa Barbara, um, and Pratap, he's a uh, junior uh, graduate student. Uh, I, for the theory aspect, we collaborated a fair bit with Justin Song at NTU uh, and his postdoc Lee Kun, and uh, some materials collaboration from Japan, Nim Tsukuba. Okay, so these guys actually uh, make the exciting work happen, and I, uh, as a team member, get a chance to uh, present it here. Okay, so this is my brief outline, because the audience here, as I see, uh, see is very diverse. I'm going to try to uh, get everybody aligned to uh, the key physics uh, issue. Uh, we'll remove materials aspect as much as possible. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the system uh, that we are looking at. Uh, it's really a powerful uh, system where a lot of interesting um, uh, band structures can be realized for testing different ideas. Then I'll try to talk briefly about how we measure in transport, electrical transport community, how do we measure uh, quantum oscillations, and how quantum oscillations are connected to the idea of uh, Berry's phase and uh, phase shift that, are, that come about. And this will have uh, sort of all the key uh, details. So graphene's uh, 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 lattice is a honeycomb lattice. Uh, the lattice itself is not a Bravais lattice. So you have to start with a triangular lattice and define a two-atom basis. That gives you the lattice. And the fact that you have these two inequivalent sites, A and B, uh, is key to understanding monolayer graphene's uh, exciting, interesting properties. Uh, in case of graphene, A and B sites are uh, populated by the same chemical species, which is carbon. Okay, now there are many, many other systems which are rich. A and B sites uh, are different chemical species. Not only that, they can also have uh, uh, interesting um, degrees of freedom of spin, and which I'm not going to be talking about. But uh, this sort of two atom basis uh, really adds a lot of the exciting flavor to graphene's world. So you do a simple tight binding calculation, you get a, a for monolayer graphene. Uh, you will see a conduction band and a valence band. This scale is of the order of few EV. Uh, and you will see six um, uh, touchings of the, um, the conduction and the valence band. Um, and you know, we love the 2D world because you know, the band structures are easy to visualize because the materials are two-dimensional. So the band structure is a three-dimensional object, whereas 3D materials have a band structure which is really a 4D object. And to visualize it, you have to take slices. So this is really uh, a nice uh, convenience for us. Okay. So uh, we measure electrical transport. So we care only about what's happening close to the Fermi energy, what's happening deep below the Fermi energy or above the Fermi energy we are uh, really don't care about it, OK? So the Fermi energy goes right through here. So we're going to ask, what's the band structure effectively look like close to the Fermi energy? And close to the Fermi energy, you have the complicated uh, curving bands. Uh, but if you expand the Hamiltonian near uh, one of these points, OK, uh, the Hamiltonian is basically a Dirac Hamiltonian, OK? And uh, uh, this is a low energy Hamiltonian. 
And a lot of this topological physics, uh, the subtext always is that, uh, which often people forget to say, is that this is an effective low energy Hamiltonian uh, and doesn't really describe uh, uh, arbitrary energies. So uh, the two points in K space where they touch, uh, the nearest neighbors are fundamentally distinct, much like the nearest neighbors in the real space are fundamentally distinct. That kind of distinctness carries out in K space as well. And so these two bands in the two valleys are different. And the Hamiltonian is the Dirac Hamiltonian, except there is a kind of a, a flipping of the chirality associated with the bands. Okay, I will not talk too much about it. So that's sort of the essence of the graphene physics uh, monolayer. So you'd say graphene was uh, studied or discovered uh, roughly about 15 years back. There, there's been a lot of water which has flown under the bridge, so people have started to look for what's new and exciting beyond monolayer graphene. And people have started to think about few layers of graphene and, and few layers of other materials as well. So what's interesting is, uh, in a sense, um, bands become flatter, um, okay? And those flattening out of the bands is sort of like a, a quenching of the kinetic energy contribution to the ha overall Hamiltonian. So if you want to boost up the relative importance of electronic interactions, uh, you want the bands to become flat. Um, then other important aspect is there are tunable symmetries. So you have important experimental knobs like electric field, and I, I'll exemplify that, by which you can break these symmetries uh, in one single device. You don't have to really make many, many devices or samples to uh, ask what happens when certain symmetries are broken. Uh, this is probably not so relevant for this uh, community, but there are some interesting ideas of non-abelian physics uh, which can be explored in some of these systems. Okay, so that's sort of the big picture of why, you know, we care about few layers of graphene or few layers of 2D material. So one uh, a practical world example of uh, the symmetry breaking is if you have one layer of graphene, so you have uh, uh, one pair of Dirac cones and you put another one, uh, you have another pair, but as you turn on the hybridization, the bands are no longer uh, linearly dispersing or Dirac-like. Uh, they have a quadratic nature, okay? Uh, and in the absence of a perpendicular uh, breaking of uh, symmetry, in this case by electric field, uh, you have a gapless system. Uh, the, at Fermi energy, uh, the excitations are gapless, much like graphene. But you apply an electric field, you break an inversion symmetry of the lattice, and you will open up a gap, and this gap is tunable with the electrical, electric field that you have. So this is how it happens. So these are two layers. Uh, this is just to give you an uh, illustration of how symmetry breaking can be done nicely in these systems. Uh, but the moment you apply an electric field, uh, electric field basically manifests itself as a kind of a different in the pot side potentials of these two layers, and that opens up a gap. And that's really a powerful knob for uh, if you want to study topology and uh, issues related to it. Uh, recently, there has been uh, a burst of activity in looking at uh, bands which are flat bands, but they have uh, churn bands, uh, churn numbers which uh, are odd, so they can experimentally be observed as edge states in these systems, and the experimental observations have uh, been seen in the last six months or so. Okay, So there is a lot of powerful physics that can be uh, studied. So I hopefully I've given you a quick flavor for why these kind of systems are interesting. Uh, and now I'm going to move to the system that we use to do this uh, particular experiment. So the system we look at is three layers of graphene. So again, you have uh, Dirac cone, uh, three copies of it, and you kind of slap them together. Uh, so you basically should get another set of three Dirac cones, as long as the layer electrons are not hopping from different sides. The moment you turn that on, much like we would expect in uh, uh, ideas of solid state physics or chemistry, there's going to be hybridization between the bands, and the bands are no longer going to be Dirac bands. So you get another set of three bands, uh, you'll see here, but they're not Dirac bands, like that of graphene. Uh, you get bands which uh, this red one and green one, uh, uh, red one is a Dirac band. It has some subtle difference, which I'll mention in a second. 
the uh, green band is a bilayer like chiral band. And these bands are at high energies away from the Fermi energy, which is right here. So we don't really care about it because transport only cares about what's happening at Fermi energy. So if you zoom in, this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, this is sort of the key properties. You call this green band the Dirac band, which is monolayer-like Hamiltonian. Uh, and the red, black one is the cross-section of the uh, full Hamilton, uh, full band. And in 3D, it looks like this. You have a, a, a bilayer like green band with trigonal warping, and you have a Dirac band, uh, which has a gap of about 1 MeV. So it's not like massless Dirac fermions, but massive Dirac fermions coexisting with uh, uh, bilayer like uh, uh, quasi particles. Okay, this overall system's electron hole symmetry is lost because uh, this gap and this gap are offset from each other, and that's an interesting aspect of the uh, system. Okay, so now there are lots of important, interesting knobs in these kind of systems, and they're a really great playground for toy model for theorists to play around with. And uh, if you have these bands, uh, the three layers are protected by mirror symmetry above the central plane. The moment you apply an electric field, uh, you will hybridize the, at these points. And that's sort of the consequence of this. So if you're interested in the Hamiltonian, uh, this is the effective Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, this is the Dirac band with a mass term. And this is the bilayer-like Hamiltonian. And these off-diagonal block is the block of electric field, which couples these two uh, and makes them hybridize. So electric field is a kind of a powerful knob here as well. Um, so hopefully I gave you a sense for the, uh, the scaffolding of, of the theory that one needs to understand what's happening here. So this is our experimental system. Again, probably not many in this audience are interested in it. But it's uh, three layers of graphene, exactly three layers, sandwiched between layers of an, uh, two insulator, uh, which is boron nitride. You make lots of electrical connections to uh, measure the electrical signals. Uh, you go through all this pain and suffering, or rather, I don't go through all this pain and suffering. My students do, and I value them for that. Uh, you get electrons flowing around without bouncing into any imperfections of the lattice. And you can measure uh, ele their electrical uh, conductivity or resistance. And effectively, what might be of meaningful is that the mean free path of electrons is comparable to the device. So the electrons just bounce around only at the boundaries. Everything inside the boundary is very, very clean. And this is sort of the structure. I will not invoke some details about the two gates, which are probably not important for this talk. But we have a very powerful knob in these experiments, is that we can tune the Fermi energy to our heart's desire. OK, so electrons live in these three layers, uh, you know, kind of hybridized together. But I have an electrostatic gate below, which I apply a voltage, and I can tune the Fermi energy on demand. That's really nice, because I don't have to, uh, uh, because the physics is sensitive to where the Fermi energy is. OK, so w one other knob that we have is uh, you know, applying a magnetic field uh, to measure the uh, sort of uh, electronic properties. And uh, what happens to this band? bands is that you have continuous density of states. Uh, the moment you start applying magnetic fields, you get Landau levels. Okay? And the Landau levels of the Dirac band and the uh, bilayer-like band are very different. Okay? That's one take-home message. Uh, and you can kind of see it by seeing that the spacing between the levels uh, for the uh, Dirac band and the bilayer-like band are very different. Uh, the Dirac band uh, Landau levels are very well spaced out. And as you increase the magnetic field, they space out even more. Something important about the physics that I will mention is that you'll see these two red dots, which are at the band edge of the band gap of the Dirac band. They re remain fixed. They do not disperse with magnetic field. Uh, this is the n equals 0 Landau level of graphene, uh, which is at, at the point, meeting point of the two Dirac cones. They, are independent. they don't really uh, uh, vary at all with magnetic field. Here, in, because of a gap formation, one half goes exactly to upper half, and another half goes below. So they don't really move around. So these are remnants of the n equals 0 lambda level, which is one way to think about the uh, unusual berry phase physics in uh, monolayer graphene. OK, so you have uh, 
Landau levels, and you can actually track uh, their evolution as a function of magnetic field. So the green are the Landau levels due to the uh, bilayer-like band, so they're dispersed as quadratically, and the red is the Dirac band, and uh, you'll see points where these uh, Landau levels become degenerate. And so what essentially the experiment that I'll talk about will use is use these Landau levels to extract out the quantum oscillation phase, which is related to the Berry's phase. Okay, so uh, this is kind of something that I already uh, told you while I was describing the figures. So this completes the outline. Now I'm going to accelerate a little bit. And so this workshop is about uh, Berry's phase, so I don't really have to uh, go too much into detail. But essentially, transport uses this uh, aspect that electrons, as you apply a voltage, electrons move about in real space. Uh, while they're moving about in real space, they're actually moving around in around on the case space. Okay, so you have a band structure. What we do, we have no way to control how the electron moves around in case space, but we can only apply voltages which kind of makes overall electrons move in real space. But in case space, they are taking kind of orbits. Uh, okay, and as they move around, uh, they will grab the flux that comes about any, any very curvature that exists in the system. Okay. Because this motion is, uh, this process is adiabatic, we don't really have to worry about breakdown of adiabaticity in, in these, these kind of experiments. Okay, so now uh, that basically sets up uh, the experiment. So uh, I, I already told you, as you apply a magnetic field, you have these closed orbits. Uh, and these closed orbits will, uh, you can quantize these. Uh, semi-classically, which is related to the area in the case space. Um, n is an integer, uh, which is an index for the Landau level, and this, this gamma parameter is related to the Berry's phase, which is this guy right here. Um, okay, and so the electrons, as they kind of move around in case space, uh, they satisfy their area satisfies a kind of a boundary condition. Uh, but this guy gives you the phase that is because of the Berry curvature that might be um, there in the band in which they're moving around, okay? And that's sort of what experimentally people measure in, in our sort of transport community. So what into, this idea, of course, is used a lot in condensed matter, uh, but uh, in 2D world, this was kind of powerfully demonstrated uh, by its first experiments in graphene, where, which is just a simple Dirac band, and you measure these quantum oscillations, uh, uh, which have terms which relate to the area of the Fermi surface, uh, and this phase, uh, which uh, can be extracted from the slope of this plot. So I'm going to spend a minute to how you go from here. So these are resistance oscillations as you pop out the Fermi surface from uh, uh, as you pop out different cylinders uh, uh, out as you change the magnetic field or density. And you plot, the, you have to be careful about plotting, but either the maxima or minima. Uh, and you plot that as a function of 1 over B space, and you plot it as a fun, uh, uh, versus the Landau level index. The slope gives you this quantity BF. It's basically, we're trying to extract out quantities here. The slope gives me BF, and the intercept at 1 over b going to 0 gives me the phase. And that's really exp exp experimental extraction of the Berry's phase. OK, so what we do in our experiment, what is relevant is that you have two bands. Both of them are gapped out. So uh, the gapping out uh, near this is interesting because around there, the Berry's phase will deviate from pi, go to 0, and for bookkeeping's sake, on the other side, flip to minus pi. Uh, so at the band edge, it goes continuously deviates from pi, because as you go close to the band edge, the Berry flux picked up by the electrons in that band is going to keep on reducing at the edge of the band bottom. Uh, you will pick up no Berry flux. And something similar happens. So this is a physics which is associated with any band that you will see deviation from any integer multiple of pi uh, close to the band edge. Okay. So what is the experimental system? How much time do I have, Chairman? OK, all right. OK, all right. Uh, so I, I, I'm good. Uh, so this is our experimental measurement. So what we measure is the resistance uh, as a function of back gate. 
as a function of magnetic field. What this color indicates is a magnitude because it's a large data set to visualize it. It's easy to do it by converting the number value of the resistance into a color. So what you see is basically uh, bands of lines which go uh, at a constant slower of magnetic field and VBG. VBG, you can think of the, it as a knob which controls the density, total density of electrons in the system. Okay, so the slow ratio of these two remains constant along the line, which is basically saying that the filling factor uh, in the system remains constant along the line. And so these are Landau levels, okay? Uh, but uh, you see some more complex things, which is, you know, you see these lines which are curving. They're not really artifacts, but they're kind of reality reflecting, uh, uh, reflecting what one can theoretically calculate so these are green, so we can actually uniquely identify which Landau level belongs to which band, Dirac band or to the bilayer like band. So these red colored or pink colored ones are the Landau levels of the monolayer band. So these guys are the crossing points that we see experimentally. Okay, so these Landau levels are mostly all Landau levels belonging to the bilayer like band, the green band which is out, uh, kind of around uh, the Dirac band, okay? So <clears throat> what we will uh, do is if I take a slice of this uh, data, uh, I'll be able to see the quantum oscillations, uh, but I will show you as a function of the Fermi energy. So when I uh, tell you there's a gap, this is the gap in the uh, monolayer-like band or the Dirac band. Okay, which is right here. I've kind of rotated the band structure just to explain um, with ease uh, relative to this diagram. Okay, so now I will look at the quantum oscillation. So one thing that I kind of a cross check from all the years of uh, studying solid state physics is if I have two Fermi surfaces, uh, the Dirac band and the bilayer band, uh, the simplest cross check is if I measure the resistance oscillations, I should see two frequencies of oscillations at when I filled up both, uh, uh, you know, let's say far at high Fermi energies, and I do indeed see two frequencies of oscillations. Okay, this is high frequency corresponds to a Fermi surface of large area, low frequency corresponds to a Fermi surface of smaller area. So smaller area is the Dirac band because it's sitting inside, it's one tenth the area of uh, the bilayer like band. So this checks out with uh, solid state physics that we know. But now if I look at the uh, quantum oscillations of only the uh, green band at this point in Fermi energy, I measure the oscillations, which is basically taking a slice right here. I see an oscillation like this. If I go to the gap of the Dirac band, okay, I'm measuring the quantum oscillations of the uh, bilayer-like band, which is topologically trivial. Uh, and I now gap out the Dirac band, I see a quantum oscillation which like this. Then I tune the Fermi energy and I bring it precisely in the valence band of the Dirac band. I see quantum oscillation which looks like this, green. Uh, these are all raw experimental data. Only this filling factor is uh, just a number that we convert the density into uh, filling factor. What you see is that the green and blue are in phase whereas red is not in phase anymore. Okay, so, uh, precisely red is off phase by uh, 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 roughly pi, okay? Now, why is that happening? Because I'm, all I'm doing is I'm measuring quantum oscillation phases of the bilayer band, which should not care about what's happening to the very uh, flux of the electrons in the Dirac band, which is inside, because the electrons care only about uh, any curvature in that band. So this is, was intriguing and puzzling us for some time, and now we understand that. It is related to the idea of filling and emptying of the Dirac band. It's intimately related, and I'm going to explain briefly how it is related. So uh, uh, this, again, might not be of it so much interest, but let me just briefly explain. What you do is you have this kind of data. You can do careful analysis. Uh, the literature is strewn with uh, uh, sort of bad analysis of extraction of Berry's phase in multiband system, and you have to be really, really careful and cross-check a lot of things. Uh, and that's precisely why I'm showing you how we do it. So you have these quantum oscillations, you map out maxima, minima, and you plot a line through it, uh, and the intercept will give you phase. You can put a bound on what are the systematics of uh, in, in our analysis. 
So this will correspond to a Berry's phase of minus pi, zero, and pi. This is the three quantum oscillations. Now, if I do all the experiments in this band, irrespective of where I am in the band, uh, as long as I'm about some energy, I always get a Berry's phase, constant Berry phase, which is this, and I get another uh, uh, if I am in the valence band. So, but if I do an experiment which is this anomalous phase, if I do this experiment as I go close to the band edge of the Dirac band, I will see continuous set of values of the phase. It will not be just pi minus pi, but be, vary from pi to minus pi. You'll see a slice in the next. So how, wh what's the meaning of this? So if you have a multiband system, which is really uh, common in condensed matter, rather than getting a nice uh, single band system like graphene, you can write down the conductance oscillations, or this is Shubnikov de Haas, but you can do de Haas 1 alpha, and you basically write down the same thing. These are thermodynamic quantities. Uh, you will see uh, oscillation with some amplitude, which relate to the Fermi surface uh, area, uh, and there is a phase associated with it. But if I have two bands, I have to write down the oscillations related to it, and their individual band densities uh, uh, will be, have to be plugged in. Now, the, the this is sort of the key part, uh, and this is the parameter space in which we do analysis in the experiment. Here, precisely the Dirac band, is, uh, which is the n equals zero Landau level, is exactly fully filled if I am looking here, or fully empty when I am here, because this guy never disperses with magnetic field. This r really remains stable. Now, what that results in is the fact that this occupancy doesn't change, but I need to reflect that in the occupation density uh, uh, inside the bilayer-like band, uh, because uh, monolayer remains almost constant. So I basically need, this expression becomes this, and I, and I can, an external knob, I can control the overall density, never the band-specific density, because you apply a gate voltage, uh, the Fermi energy in the two bands will be the same. And that basically means I need to rewrite this like this, and what you basically see that this guy's quantum oscillation phase shift will care about the occupancy of the band, which is the monolayer band. You cannot uh, ignore that. And this uh, n equals zero Landau is a special Landau level, uh, sort of connected to the pi Berry phase. Uh, it never gets emptied out. So you basically get a factor uh, which uh, either gets here, uh, gives you a factor of half times two pi. Uh, when you have the, you're, when you're sitting in the gap of the uh, Dirac band, uh, you don't get any phase because the, uh, the that that particular Landau level uh, is completely gapped out. And then when you fill it up, you basically get another factor of pi. So you basically get a minus pi here and a pi here. So because you have two bands and you cannot control populating one band or the other, uh, you will get an, an anomalous phase pickup of the coexisting band. So what we experimentally did was basically map out this anomalous phase as you move through the Fermi energy. And you, uh, this is, I kind of alluded to it. You move from pi to minus pi. And precisely when the uh, monolayer band or the Dirac band is gapped out, the Berry phase goes to 0. This is kind of consistent. So I think this is the essence of the story. Uh, I will uh, kind of stop here and take any questions. Uh, I missed out some one more technical part, but I'm not going to ask unless some, the question. This is what I promised. Uh, I mostly delivered on it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. Yeah. So it turns out, uh, uh, let me just bring up that slide. That might be one way to think about it. But it, the wave functions, if you look, uh, they're actually n not centered on the central layer. Uh, uh, maybe my understanding is un incorrect. But let me just, yeah, OK. So. <laughs>
Uh, you mean for the breaking of this electron hole symmetry? Yeah. So at the parameter space where, so it's a uh, very interesting question. So thanks uh, for that. So in this regime in which I told you, there is, as far as we understand, uh, this offset can be simply understood in terms of uh, these hopping parameters. We don't have to invoke interactions. We do see effect of electronic interactions at slightly higher magne uh, magnetic field. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, electron, electron, uh, the, in this system, the electron electron interactions are strong. We can see it very easily. I can uh, maybe show you some more data related to it. But this uh, we, uh, kind of band structure related thing is not explicitly due to electronic interactions, but electron electron interactions are uh, manifested easily. Yeah, of course, of course. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh huh. Multi band. Uh, yeah. And a lot of these wild semi-metals, and you know, people went to do SDH and then extrapolate the Landau Finn diagram and get. Uh, trivial yeah, so or non-trivial, it can... One, yeah, so the one sub-message of our story besides uh, uh, what I said is that people really, really need to be super careful when multibands are involved and extraction of berry phase uh, is not so trivial. Other bands kind of play an implicit role in it. One has to be very careful. So that's, that's sort of the point uh, I think you're also trying to make. So you have to be very, very careful. Particularly in wild systems, there are gazillion bands. Okay, there are 24 nodes. Uh, you really need to be very careful. Uh, in, what, what, what's convenient about this system, unlike Vile, is that you can tune the Fermi energy on demand. There, you can't even tune the Fermi energy to extract out the role of other bands or gap those guys out. Uh, here we can. And that's why it's uh, interesting and important. Uh, the other is main message of our talk is that close to the band edge that the phase changes from pi to minus pi has never been experimentally measured. Uh, in condensed matter systems. I don't know about other. And we show that it, indeed that's the case. Yeah, one MeV uh, gap. So not massless Dirac fermion, but massive Dirac fermions. Uh, as you go closer and closer to the point, they become, uh, they will have a quadratic nature because of the gap. Opening up. I mean, I'm using kind of mixed terminology from the field I work in, uh, where people kind of mix up the terminology from high energy physics. Yeah. We measure resistance effectively, yes. Magnetic field and density. Density of charge carriers. So, uh, just to explain, I. One effect of the magnetic field is you'll start to uh, make these uh, density of states not continuous, but you'll form orbits. That's one knob. Uh, the other knob is I can tune the Fermi energy on demand. I can fill up the electron cell here, here, or here, or above. That's completely under my control. Uh, uh, in this talk, I did not talk a lot about electric field. I used only the density of, uh, which is basically, but electric field is an important knob. It's not the same thing as density. Uh, so you're uh, uh, sort of forcing me to make uh, the content a little bit more technical and complete. Thankful for that. So if I apply a single gate, electrostatic gate, in a field effect transistor, I change only the density, but I also don't have control over electric field. I have some electric field, which is uncontrolled. If I want independent control over density and electric field, I really need to put two gates. I put another gate on the top, 
And so these two guys, linear combination of these voltages and some geometric capacitance gives me control over density and electric field independently. So I can travel along lines of constant electric field, travel along lines of constant density. In this experiment, electric field does not play a lob and the parameter space that I showed you, uh, the electric field is not substantial. Uh, the PRL paper that I mentioned here has a more detailed exploration of quantum Hall physics with electric field, which, um, but did I answer your question about what we experimentally measuring? We are measuring resistance as a function of density, which is Fermi energy and magnetic field. And suppose if you uh, had studied the uh, use the time dependent electric field. So time dependent electric field. Yeah. Okay. You were varying. So the result will be same in both the cases. So uh, I'm guessing you're talking about some sort of Floquet engineering or what? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. This is under that question. We know that the effect of time dependent. Well. Uh, okay, so for that to happen, uh, uh, the question is uh, valid. Uh, for that to happen, you have to go to electric fields of a time scale, which right now we cannot access. Uh, you know, need to go to time scales of terahertz, which is not something uh, we can do. Uh, but that's there are already experiments by other people which are basically showing uh, some engineering because of that. Last question. Uh, there is no angular arrangement. This is the, thanks for asking uh, that this question as well. These three layers are uh, as much as we can call it God-given three layers. Essentially, we take a crystal and we peel out uh, uh, you know, many layers, uh, but we find the guy which is exactly three layers and they are not misaligned with each, relative to each other. No, 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 no. These are found uh, on the ground as three layers. So these are not assembled layer by layer uh, as three layers. Sir, it's not God, it's Tanaguchi given. <laughs> no, that's the boron nitride, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the ground on which we uh, put this thing. I think we we'll close on that note. Thanks to all the four speakers. And we have a nice long lunch break, right? Come back at 2.30. Thank you. And two more speakers. Two more speakers.